guess I'm a little perplexed right now. Starting to think about things. I just had that eerie feeling of like Twilight Zone, you know. Starting to hear sounds. <laughs> I can feel the earth shaking. I don't think I want to go there. You know, my wife's the only person I ever told. I never told anybody, not my parents, not my brother, not my best friends, not my wife, nobody. I go in tears talking about it now. It, it's affected me. I'd like to think it hasn't affected me. I like to think I'm, I can tough it out and everything's okay. It has affected me. I will admit to it. Um, you just saw a little bit of it now. Um, I can't watch the bomb. Hood was the biggest uh, kill it done bomb uh, blown up within the continental United States. <clears throat> In the morning of July 5th, 1957, about four in the morning, they put us in a trench. Uh, I think it was a mile from ground zero or less. I was in a platoon with 40 other people and uh, we had a, for protection, we just had our utility jackets, our weapons, uh, helmets, and a gas mask. The attitude in the trenches was these people were concerned but they didn't know what was going to happen they had no idea and uh they was you know these were some these were well trained trained men so it would not have i don't think they would have been afraid to go into combat shoot people without any problem but they didn't know what this bomb was we followed the instructions which were to crouch down, uh, put our backs towards the, uh, the shot, and uh, bow our heads and cover our, our eyes. And we got to the point that everybody was basically in the trenches. It was about, they started the countdown. They went 59, 58, 57. I got my gas mask on, I had trouble cinching it down, and it got down to nine, I grabbed my helmet, put it up to my head about like that, and the bomb went off. It really was the most, I'll never experience anything like it again, I know that. It was completely daylight at midnight, brighter than the brightest day you ever saw. I cannot begin to describe the light that came into my eye. I was totally blinded. When I came out of the blindness, I saw my hands, and by this time, I actually saw the blood vessels and, and my bones in my arm, because as I came across like this, it actually was totally x-rayed. You could literally just see every bone in there, everything. Even the guy's bones and back that was in front of you. That's how bright the light was to go from through the back of your head, through your eyes, and into your fingers, you're seeing your bones in your hands. How did that, how did it come through all that <laughs> to get to your bones, that you could visually see them like an x-ray? The light faded, and it's like streaks of lightning from ground, from the ground to the sky, about every two feet around you. And then that faded, and it was like giant bar balls in front of your eyes. When the wave hit me, uh, you know, it, it knocked me over. I actually flipped over. All of us fell down on the ground. The blast caught me in the face, 
broke my glasses, knocked me on my butt, put a whole bunch of shrapnel in my face. It's mostly like uh, little glass beads that were melted glass beads in my neck and had a hole in my neck and one in my lip. And, and it felt just like you would take a red hot iron, like you iron with an iron on an ironing board, and put it to your neck. There was extreme heat, extreme heat. There was pig. There was people screaming, uh, and and running. And there was panic. There was panic and people screaming because of the heat. Everybody started yelling, and, and some people calling out for their mothers and. Uh, some of the trenches collapsed. I don't know. It's like I had lost it. And uh, I don't know why, because um, I'm losing it right now. The whole clump of ground, 10 yards this way, 15 yards this way, 10 yards back over here. A few guys were having a little trouble. They were throwing up. It was a normal thing, I guess. We had to dig two guys out. And we're standing there watching the mushroom cloud farm, and you could see it with the naked eyes that sucked all the sand up. <clears throat> there was people were gathering then, kind of coming back and looking at this spectacular, spectacular shot. It was it, it actually you're gonna. Die when I when I tell you this, it was it was so big. It, it, it looked it, the colors were beautiful in a sense. I hate to say that. You see this molten cloud changing color as as it it kind of turns within itself. Beautiful purples and lavenders and popping and blipping and just doing. And it was boiling and just orange and reds and black and gray and whatever. And it just kept boiling, rolling like this. And the higher it got, the more it flowed outwards. It, that thing just keep. it seems like it keeps on going and it keeps expanding. And then it reaches a point where it kind of colors up at the top. And the very, very top of the mushroom was white. And it actually comes down over the cloud the mushroom cloud, which is all ice. It looks like frost. But don't forget, <clears throat> it's 35,000 feet up in the air. As it closed in, it was uh, a huge red ring all the way around as far as you could see from the horizon on, or from the horizon. And as it closed up like an aperture on a camera, on one side of the red ring was daylight on the other side was night. I saw planes going through it, which, you know, even at its growth stage, there were we were flying aircraft through it. The unforgettable sound, the roar, it roared, roared and roared and roared, and men yelling and uh, confused and... Uh, um, Woods, I think he defecated in his pants and all kinds of weird stuff. Grown men in tears. And I saw officers saying the word, oh my God, what are we doing? And then that shit started flying out of the sky. Now we became a little very concerned with stuff coming, crashing down on you now, because there are boulders, rocks and stuff that maybe uh, three inches in diameter, two inches in diameter, but you had, if you, so you, Got your helmet on or kept it on if it'd be something got knocked off, you know, during the explosion. And uh, if you didn't have your helmet on, you'd get conged real good. Uh, they took roll call, and there were two people that were missing, but we went on without them. Never found out again what, what happened to those two. Um, there were a number of trucks that were turned over on their sides and things like tires and whatever were smoldering from the fire. And I seen all the steel from bulldozers, cranes, cars, trucks, everything. 
completely destroyed. And when you see a bulldozer blade rip like paper, you know it's powerful. The tank retriever was the main thing. That huge chunk of metal ended up to be a, a puddle the size of a chair. In the course of this, there was a one-star general, Marine general, who was, who was bewildered. And uh, I guess he had kind of lost, temporary loss is cool. And he says, I don't know where I am. I've lost my men, I've lost my men. And, and I says, I says, calm down, General. I says, look, I says, I, I've been in a few of these shots now. It's okay, we just gotta wait till the dust settles a little bit. And uh, <clears throat> he was all upset. I, I, I don't know, I think I calmed him down, but he was uh, pretty upset. And I seen some guys coming towards us, like to the, right of us towards the bomb even, like they were walking towards us as we were walking to the left of the blast. And I thought, what are they wearing? They have some kind of different clothes on because things were dangling like they had padded clothes or something. It, it looked odd. And uh, through some other people and, and talking over the years, I, I think it was their flesh. Nobody had uniforms that dangled like that. Uh, you know, I, th I think a lot of us knew that this was not a good thing for us. That was the most breathtaking thing I have ever experienced in my life. Uh, I'm happy I was able to be there for that, that series of tests. I would never do it again. I'd go to Canada first. It haunts me to think of what I had witnessed and not realized at the time the import of what we were doing at the time, actually serving as guinea pigs. We were just was like an experiment animal to use in a lab. And I think a lot of my uh, lumps and that and nodules I've had taken out my body is due to that. I had developed a uh a tumor in 04 when I went down and registered as an atomic vet. And it uh, turned out that the tumor was called swanoma tumor. It was caused by ionized radiation. And uh, for 10 years now, I've been trying to get uh, compensation for that. But the, the government does not want to admit to anybody that was that was harmed by any radiation. They've been, they've been putting me off for over 10 years now. I've had more than 30 take it out. And I've had my head sprayed and shaved. When I got out of the military, I had after effects, like I was losing my hair, I had, uh, spine problems and this and that and then and then I started uh, <clears throat> gaining weight I gained a lot of weight I was obese and I was getting um, um, uh, very uh, nervous I didn't want to see anybody I didn't want to meet anybody I was like turning into a loner I just felt like it was gonna be the end of the world and I was gonna do what I can right now. For probably 20 years, I abused alcohol and uh, I was not a very good person in my mental state. I have 
spent a number of years when I was out of the service waking up in the middle of the night seeing the atomic bomb. I want to be sleeping, try to sleep at night sometimes. I didn't sleep for a long time very well. I'd always, always have this bright light that would flash on. Hello, time to get up. No, no, it isn't. It's got no light bulb out there, turkey. You're just dreaming you had, you know. Uh, <laughs> so it can be a kind of, especially if you get drunk, you're in a bar, and all of a sudden you see, hallucinating, you see these damn <laughs> atomic bomb going off, and all these bright lights, and you're, hello. You can't even see the chicky boos because the lights are so bright. And um, really, The only thing that they did for us was for us to secrecy. We, we couldn't talk about it. We couldn't talk about it to anybody for $10,000 fine or 10 years in prison. Everyone was told that you're never, ever to discuss this again, that you, what you saw stays with you forever. You can't tell your wife, you can't tell your kids, and particularly you can't talk amongst yourself. So you can't turn to your buddy and say, gee, what'd you think of that shot? Or have any discussion regarding the atomic bomb. That's where the paranoia was. They put the fear of God in you. You know, the, you know when you start talking about treason, they, they can be executed. That's, a, that's enough to, I mean, go to jail is one thing, but treason. It's, it's quite a cover up. It's been a cover up for over 50 years. I call it mass genocide. And I mean it that way. I think it it's, can be only described as genocide. You don't send 14,000 troops through ground zero and not call it anything but genocide. Somebody knew what was occurring. There's been a lot of people that died. I would venture to say that there was more people killed in the testing, not immediately, but over the 50 year period of our, our silence, that there were probably more people killed from the testing than there was in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Well, they knew everything that was going to happen and what danger was involved in it. They're just hoping you all die before they have to do anything. I don't know that anybody will ever know uh, because I suspect that nobody will give a damn uh, when I'm gone. Uh, there won't be any genetic study done uh, at my autopsy uh, to determine whether or not anything was passed on. If it was done for science and and the availability to, to the rest of the human race to know that, uh, that we don't need it. It's way too devastating. If you could just see the colors, if you could just hear it, hear it, not on the television or in the movie, but the actual thing, I, I think you would agree with me. Whoever is listening to this,